All right, welcome back to the Real Features podcast. Um, we're absolutely delighted to introduce our next guest. Um, he's one of the most accomplished Australian thriller directors going around. You'd know him for producing The Reef, Black Water, The Jungle, essentially any movie with a dangerous creature haunting people. That's him. Um, <laughs> uh, he even participated in the anthology horror series, um, The ABCs of Death, which I really loved uh, as well. Um, and off the, hot, uh, off the uh, hot release of his latest thriller, uh, The Reef Stalked, uh, welcome, Andrew Trokey. Thanks, guys. Great to be here. Awesome. Yeah. And uh, just straight off the bat, um, mm. when you look at your credits, Yep. A lot of animals, a lot of things, hunting people. Mm. Were you attacked by something as a kid? Was there something <laughs> that is a catalyst for that type of genre that you're attracted to? I once got bitten by a dog, but I don't think that's it. Um, uh, <laughs> there was this angry chicken once. Um, but uh, no, I, I, I think um, it, it, is, it really is just a whole bunch of coincidences that ended up me being where I am. Like, you know, it's kind of, when I reflect on it, it's kind of just kind of weird that it just ended up where I am. Really, because <laughs> um, I, I, how it all started really was that I, I had this bigger film, which was a sci-fi film that I was trying to get up, and uh, it just, you know, it was like eight, ten million dollars, and it, it fell over, and it was very discouraging. And I've kind of felt, and I was a first-time director, I kind of felt, oh well, you know, this is difficult. And the, the guy I was working with, he just kind of said, that's it, I'm out. But I'm sort of a bit more tenacious. And um, so I kind of got the vibe that I had to do a smaller project. So I started looking at low budget films. And one of them was Open Water. And I saw, uh, uh, and that's actually an Australian story, I believe, you know, about people great on, the, on the reef. But it was only made for a very small budget. And at the same time, I looked around my living room. There was a blow up crocodile that somebody had given my kids. And I kind of put two and two together and it was like, oh yeah, that would make a good story. So I just started researching crocodile stories and I came up with some crackers. And yeah, that sort of gave me the impetus to write the script. And then it kind of, from there, you know, people wanted more of the same stuff. But if you think about it, <clears throat> we do have a lot of top level predators here in Australia. And um, there's no better, um, you know, bad guy, I guess, than an apex predator, especially if it's still alive and they can actually eat you in the real. Yeah. 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 It's a good point living in Australia. One of my questions was actually going to be, uh, yeah. you know, we've got some of the most dangerous creatures. Uh, if you'd had, had the next one uh, lined up, given that there's so much to choose from, it's like a menu of uh, <laughs> dangerous things. <laughs> yeah, especially the world sees us, I think still, still some really weird lost frontier or final frontier with all these dangerous animals. You know, so <laughs> I love the exotica of Australia. Yeah. That's it. And so specifically with the reef um, stalked, yeah, that's a follow up to the 2010 original, which was an absolute cracker. Thanks. What sparked your interest to make the sequel? Yeah, that's a great question. Look, it's only a sequel in name only, really, and in style. Like the styles are both similar. Both I didn't really want to use um, CGI sharks. I wanted to reuse the real animals. But um, what really sparked my interest was that I finally found a script uh, that I wanted to make because, you know, ever since making the original, people have been coming to me with shark scripts, but they've all been pretty, um, you know, low rent sort of shark NATO type things, which <laughs> you know, as much as I like those films, you know, and, and we all, we all, there are, there's a place for them. It's not me. So um, I was saying no. And then, um, yeah, I just came up with this idea after seeing this amazing play about domestic abuse and then, I'm a, a surfer, so there's the there's the whole thing of um, surfers calling sharks men in the grey suit. So I kind of put those two things together and went, well, maybe it can be about domestic abuse and it can be more like an allegory of the shark. It can be just a thrilling shark movie or it can be about the shark is man in the grey suit and he's still stalking these women and what are they going to do to get rid of him? So that was enough to entice me to want to write again because I thought, oh, well, this is something that could be a bit more elevated, a bit more... Um, cerebral apart from just being a shark film you know it's not going to be a, uh, a documentary on a, a domestic abuse but it's certainly going to have that element in there somewhere so yeah that's what got me going again mm. yeah absolutely yeah. and you can definitely we we were um both lucky enough to go to the melbourne premiere and and, yeah. and watch it from there and and yeah we're able to see the um see q a with the cast and all that oh, sort of stuff and yeah Excellent. yeah that no, was great yeah yeah um, and you're completely right. We definitely, um, that takeaway, like you said, that of um, that, the parallels that you had between the, um, uh, I mean, you know, it's such a great story. We sort of showing that 
domestic uh, violence, but it, you're seeing that through, I guess, the actions of, you know, the shark attack mm. or, you know, mm. a, a very female cast. And yeah. Um, I guess, yeah, I mean, as a result of that, you know, you sort of see the mental toll, the physical toll yeah. uh, of the parallels of that. Um, and even the impact, uh, I thought it was quite an interesting one, but the impact of the friendships and kind of how that um, uh, second guessing of, of when to jump into the water or jump in when you're seeing something. Um, and and I guess, yeah, you, you kind of, you sort of pick up on things. And I, I guess in when you, everyone kind of, um, a lot of people have seen domestic violence and things like that, but you sort of yeah. never know that sort of, so it's such an interesting way that you sort of portray that across both in an actual physical shot where it's clear, clear in that example, but then having that, um, yeah, domestic one as well. So, um, yeah. Yeah. You know, thanks. Cause it, it was a matter of like, obviously there's a lot about domestic, uh, abuse and violence, but not in a popularist genre like this, you know, like, um, yeah. I think I've seen any other shark film that's tried to do this. So, <laughs> uh, you know, so yeah, that was what the challenge was. Yeah. Um, one thing I thought was cool in the Q&A we saw at the um, premiere, a few of the actresses said just on your approach in terms of how on days of filming, obviously you're out on the water, it's pretty brutal conditions. So a lot of the time they said you'd kind of prep them, get all your questions out, know your character. And then once you're out there, you're kind of just existing out there. Was that kind of accurate to how you directed and what was your approach? Um, yeah. Yeah. Because we we're under such, such so under the gun for time, and as you said, being in waist deep water for ten hours with the <laughs> wind and the sun and the rain and all sorts of problems, um, I just don't feel there's a lot of time to get into character development on set. So I try and do it all prior to you know. So we got we got them up there for four or five days beforehand on location, sitting in the kayak, sitting in the boats, doing kayaking, you know, bonding together, doing table reads, doing blocking and so by that stage it's like that's where i go to them you're you know i'm handing the character over to you up until now it's been my character now it's yours and then hopefully on the day it's just fine adjustments so if, if it's like no you're looking in the wrong spot or no that's not the right emotion then that will um that will that's when i step in but otherwise yeah i, I kind of like to see what they bring as much as possible i don't really want to micromanage actors yet yeah mm. very cool mm. awesome. um, uh, also, uh, you mentioned a lot of those. There's, there's a lot, I guess, a lot of uh, shark, you know, creature feature type shark films out there. There's a lot of where they overdo the CGI. Um, yeah. in, in your film, you have, I thought, a very tasteful mix of, well, essentially you're using a lot of, you know, real shark yeah. footage, yeah. which I think, I mean, I guess that was, you know, how much of a conscious effort was that that you wanted to, you know, bring the real sharks in that kind of give that, uh, um, I guess the b lifting the suspense that you've actually got, not just a CGI shark that sort of, you know, kind of runs around and it kind of, you lose that. I feel like yeah. you kind of lose a little bit of that. Um, and even, I think you tastefully did, you'd sort of see the shark, but then pan into the camera shot where you're sort of seeing the camera as the view of the shark, uh, you know, kind of doing that as well, where you're sort of getting that, um, yeah, was that I guess a fairly conscious decision by you that something that you you really wanted to do because it is I guess an easy escape to kind of dominate with CGI a lot in in those sort of that genre of film. That yeah, said. well, I think yeah. he said it, which is I wanted to keep it real. Um, you know, there's a great Stephen King quote, which is once you see the zipper down the back of the monster, the the, the illusion's gone. And and I think um, the more you can make your threat real and um you know terrifying the more people are going to get enthralled by the drama so it's very much a case of wanting to keep it as real as possible i mean all my films i've tried to steer away from cgi and quite frankly look there's some fantastic cgi but you've got to have a really good budget to do it fantastically because mm -hmm. um the reason those films don't look any good is that they've chucked the cgi in but they haven't really gone into the detail of the cgi um, that costs a lot of money because somebody there sitting there putting different textures tones and all this sort of stuff um so if you've got a big budget film, sure, go CGI, but um, I didn't. And so I wanted to keep it real. And yeah, I think the real footage really helps it keep it real. You know, you go, well, that's a real animal as opposed to, oh yeah, there's just a, another CGI. <laughs> yeah. Coming, you know? yeah. 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 Sure. So Andrew, changing gears a little. Yep. So we've got a listener question here. Yeah. Um, and it's, it reads, howdy, Paul and Sam. I love films with found footage style. 
which films do you think do this best other than the obvious Blair Witch? Yeah. So some examples there are Creep, Chronicle, Grave Encounters, Paranormal Activity, but is there anything that kind of jumps out to you in that, I guess, that style? Well, obviously my own film. Other than that. <laughs> yes, yes, The Jungle, yeah, absolutely. Uh, you know, I, I did enjoy, uh, it, that's a great question because I, I think the found footage um, genre, obviously I'm, you, you're getting the vibe I like real and that's, you know, real but not real. Um, but it's also incredibly difficult in some levels because, I, you know, I went into this, um, I made The Jungle to try and get a film out quickly, to try and avoid all the hassles of years and years of financing and also because I wanted the challenge of seeing whether I could do this style of film because it's a very different style of film. Um, and the challenges were quite significant because to try and put it all together so that it feels real without edits is difficult. Not to have your score because, you know, a thriller really thrives on... Um, the music and when the music drops and all that, that was really difficult not to have any production values like well-known actors. And so it really is a, a, a great um, art making a great found footage film. Um, and I really like, you know, I've got quite a, oh, well, not a lot, but I mean, like I, I like Chronicle a lot. I, I like Paranormal Activity a lot, obviously Blair Witch. There was that one and I always get the name wrong about the last, um, the last. Uh, <laughs> it uh, Cloverfield? Yeah. Oh. Yeah, no. Well, Cloverfield's big, but no, it yeah. was it was it was uh, what what do you call it when you uh, exorcism? So I think it's oh, the last, the last oh. exorcism of Emily yeah. Rose, wasn't yeah. it? Yeah, yeah, that's, like yeah. That, yeah. I mean, um, it fell apart a little at the end, but I thought look, great character development. I mean, that's the thing mm, that these mm. things have to do. They have to because they're playing on the characters. You've got to get to know them a little better and all that sort of stuff. But I've got to tell you, watching Paranormal Activity here by myself one night, I made sure the doors were locked after I'd seen that. <laughs> I had the exact same thing. When I first watched that, that scared the shit out of me. Yeah, yeah. That was so scary. Yeah. yeah. Totally, totally. Is it, I mean, you talk about, yeah, you know, it's such a great way to do a film on a budget, but done well, it's just mm. as equally as creepy. Oh, um, yeah, yeah totally. in, in that view, the lighting and everything. And you can do that grainy camera that you just can't yeah. Um, yeah, yeah. really see what's going on, but you know there's something there. And, and yeah, yeah. I mean, well. if, if you can convince the people it's real, then I think it's even more scary in a way. I mean, I think that's what paranormal works so well for me because it's like all of us have to go to bed and <laughs> in these houses and... Yeah. Oh, when some of the dooners are getting dragged off them and stuff, you're like, oh my God. Oh. I'm getting chills just thinking about that now. Oh my God. Yeah. <laughs> But it's, it's interesting because that first sort of found footage is, is coming into so many, I mean, it's a typical horror one, I guess it works so well, but it's sort of coming into a lot of different different um, genres are starting to pick it up as well. Yeah. It's definitely starting to, to take off. But um, yeah, no, there's some good ones. Uh, the other one I, I really liked was, um, I mean, obviously Rec uh, is a great one as oh, well. Yeah, that's, which was, that's was fantastic. Really, yeah. yeah. Films actually, yeah. And um, VHS as well, which um, they've yeah. done a through anthology series on those where it's sort of, yeah, the found found footage on about three different films and each one, I think they're up to about three or four of those. But, yeah, they're always, yeah, a lot of fun as well. So Yeah, yeah. Yeah. Yeah, yeah nice. Very cool. Cool. So... Paul Cookson, are we up to the the nostalgia section of this podcast? Yeah, yes. Actually, I was going to actually, I just thought of another quick quick one Please actually go. off the back of that. But is, is there, are there any thriller or, or horror directors at the moment that that really have your eye in particular that you think are, are really, I mean, it seems like, um, you know, it's obviously a really strong uh, genre, I think, you know, with the, the help of Shudder, uh, sorry, um, yeah, Shudder, uh, the yeah. streaming service as well, it focuses on it. You know, Jordan Peele's doing obviously some, yeah. some massive things as well. Is there any any in particular that is sort of catching your eye that you really enjoy uh, sort of the work of? Well, you just mentioned Jordan Peele. I really loved Get Out. I thought that was a really clever film, which, like I say, was elevated like I've been trying to do, you know, because, um, um, you, you know, as crazy as that ending is, um, <laughs> up until that stage, it's sort of like you're going, wow, this is insanely intriguing and we've got all these racist issues coming up as well. Like, yes. you know, so that was that was definitely a film that I um, really responded to quite strongly. Mm. Um, you know, I I don't know if it's from a director point of view. I quite like The Quiet Place just because um, the original, because that once again had, I mean, you know, once again, if you look at the logic of that, those, it doesn't kind of stack up, but it doesn't really matter because there was so much intrigue there and and the, the scares were really good and not really so much in the thriller space but just because i love his some of his films 
Guilera uh, del Toro is one of sort of my favorite directors at the moment because I just think, um, you know, I've always loved Pan's Labyrinth and um, oh, yeah. well, everything he's done since then. And, you know, some of it's been a bit um, commercial and not so interesting, but, you know, he still has always seems to put something in there that you can find to like. He does. Yeah, absolutely. Mm. Yeah. Mm. Oh, great. Sorry, Sam. I was yep. jumped in on the. <laughs> no, hey, do what you got to do. But very exciting part. And this is one of the things I love speaking to directors like yourself mm. to find out what films make them tick. And you selected Blue Velvet. Yeah. David Lynch classic. Yeah. Why did you select Blue Velvet and what does it mean to you? Yeah, I guess it was at a formative time when I was making films uh, and I've never seen anything like it. I don't know if I've ever seen anything since. <laughs> uh, <laughs> And it's just, yeah, how do you explain? I mean, on one level, it's, you know, Douglas Sirk meets Pasolini or, you know, this sort of heightened realism of, of melodrama and then these strange characters that, you know, you'd never find anywhere. And then the fact that it's just you scratch the surface of normality in middle America and there's this dark underground just really, really intrigued me and it sort of left me thinking, what's happening in my neighbourhood? Yeah. yeah. <laughs> <laughs> you know um and you know i watched it again the other day having not watched it for a long time and it still stacks up i mean Dante. it's a touch slow in parts but you know the and and you know it's not like it's action based it's basically set in about four houses mm -hmm. and a yeah. car ride um it's just the the interesting character dynamics and the relationships which are so out there yeah yeah yeah, yeah. absolutely I, I guess as a bit of summary for a bit of an introduction for the film of people who may not know it's of course that david direct uh, david lynch who directed and, and wrote it um stars kyle mclaughlin isabella rosalini um dennis hopper and a very young laura <laughs> dern um goes for exactly two hours yeah. um budget was about six mil and i think it clocked in at about 8.6 mil um uh 7.7 7 on imdb and 95 percent on rotten tomatoes the, the brief plot um although if you're listening to this you've probably yeah you've probably seen it but uh just in case um the discovery uh essentially the, the plot line is the discovery of several uh, of a severed human ear is found in a field uh, that leads a young man on an investigation related to a beautiful, mysterious nightclub singer and a group of psych, uh, psychopathic criminals who have kidnapped her child. Um, so that's the brief summary. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. Do you remember the first time you 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 watched it, and and I guess you know where you were and that experience yeah. as well, yeah. and and obviously it it affected you know stayed with you after that, but yeah, yeah, yeah. Well, um, there used to be a great cinema, and uh, and all the great cinemas seemed to have closed, but um, in Sydney called the Valhalla, which was up on Glebe Point Road, and it showed a lot of these sort of out of left field sort of films, you know. Jodorowsky and all these sort of more um, classic art school or film school films. And uh, yeah, I went to a screening one night there of this and um, yeah, it just kind of left me kind of, because I already knew of his work from Razorhead. Um, ah, and then he yes. went on to, 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 to do, you know, some great things. Um, what was the TV series? Um, Twin Peaks. Twin yes. Peaks, thank you very yep. much. Yeah. <laughs> yeah, so, you know, he's always been in that vein of... Uh, kind of crazy supernatural slash psycho weirdness and reality you know like heightened reality it, it yeah. just intrigues me um but yeah it really really stayed with me um and that's why i chose it yeah yeah mm. good one a, a performance because i saw it years ago and i rewatched it recently but dennis hopper <laughs> in that is psychotic <laughs> and some of the trivia on this film which we'll get to shortly but a lot of people passed on that role because it was simply too crazy, too horrible. Mm. And he said that it's totally him. <laughs> <laughs> but like, I don't know, just as a role, I just, I don't even know if there's wow. like question here. But yeah, I know. I know but, <laughs> um, yeah, did, did his performance stand out to you? Or oh my what, God, what does was... it stand out? Yeah. yeah. It's, yeah. Insane. it's just so good. It's just like... <laughs> When he's breathing on that thing and <laughs> mummy and saying yeah. mummy and it's just like fuck, it was, yeah, no, it's it's fantastic performance. I love I love Dennis Hopper in that. As, have as you I worked did, with any yeah. actors or actresses mm -hmm. who have taken you back, and you probably wouldn't say on set, but like in their performance, you've seen something that's just so, I guess, mesmerizing right there. Has that happened to you before? When you're just like, whoa, yeah. okay, yeah, I think um, Maeve Dermody in the first Black Water. 
was insanely good, especially at the ending where she had to turn on the um, the grief. Like there was a kind of because that was the first film I was I had directed, and maybe this is why I'm a bit more standoffish. But anyway, I was pretty. I, I was probably far too much in Maeve's face about what I wanted, and she kind of just looked at me and said, "Andrew, just let me let me go, let me have a go." Mm. Um, this was especially the crying scene at the end, and I went, "Oh yeah, okay, sh- I'll just walk away." <laughs> and <laughs> and uh, yeah, she was she really turned it on, and I, I'll always remember, you know, myself choking up behind the camera as she was doing that scene. Um, wow. So yeah, no, it was pretty special that one. I mean, they've all all my all the actors I worked with all had their moments, but that one's one that really stands out. Yeah. Mm. yeah. And did you take much from, yeah, much else from Blue Velvet? Uh, did you think there's, there was any parts of that that influenced your style or you kind of things that you really liked in that movie that made you kind of think, oh, you know, that's that they've done that very well and, and kind of made you think about, yeah, with your movie making? Um, um, yeah, how it, maybe you not, not in techniques, but certainly for about the next 10 years, I wanted to be David Lynch and was trying to do all these, you know, kind of crazy psycho <laughs> <Yeah. laughs> <laughs> And I do, I do in uh, Blackwater pay homage to that severed ear because there's a severed ear in, in, in uh, Blackwater. Of course, which, yeah. You know, Kind of didn't really need to be there, I guess, but I kind of <laughs> that's so cool. we I forced to, it in there. Let's get it in there. I have yeah, to put a seven ear in there. It's, it's, it's my true. homage to David Lynch's Blue Velvet. So, um, Great point. yeah. So, but yeah, look, it was just, I guess, more on a personal level rather than a filmic stylistic level. I just, it just really resonated with me that I just like that sort of weird stuff. Yeah. 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 There's no one like him. You can honestly say that, yeah. like his films. He doesn't care. He writes them. He controls it. You can just tell it's unashamedly yeah. him, yeah. which is, is yeah. pretty awesome. And and yeah. it's I just find that weird, interesting thing of like I said, Day, uh, Douglas Sirk or you know, written on the window, or whatever that heightened melodrama. And then he just you go back into the normal world, and it's like this is a moment, you know, with those that stuffed bird at the end. <laughs> yeah, the, the robins that have come, I guess, from her dream or whatever it is. Yeah, and it's so fake, but it doesn't seem to matter because you're just going, yeah, it's kind of a David Lynch film, of course. Yeah, <laughs> <that's it. laughs> there was a lot of random stuff with that. Like they claimed that it was a real robin, but the crew had stuffed it, and then oh, was, right. I don't know all this. So yeah. they found a dead robin and then stuffed it and uh, made it into oh, that. Wow. Like it's. Wow. All this weird. It's still kind yeah. of no one really confirmed it, but yeah, bizarre stuff. <laughs> yeah, yeah, totally. That's yeah. what I like. It's just bizarre. It's not yeah. the usual sort of you know Hollywood. We've got to have a this you know got to look. Like, I mean, when they when they go into um, uh, that place where um, what's his name is does the song, um, you know, candy colored clown, yeah. and the women in the background, it's sort of like a Diane Arbus photo or something. These you know <laughs> rather large prostitutes yeah. or whatever they are and it's just, like, <laughs> just kind of you know a normal hollywood film would be kind of very cute girls in bikinis or something yeah that's so true yeah <laughs> <laughs> yeah he's got his style that's yeah. for sure yeah. um andrew are you ready for a bit of trivia sure <laughs> all right let's go this is a very popular segment Hugely. I just say that just because I, I run it. But that's <laughs> it. Like it yeah. yeah, yeah. It's mainly <laughs> from me. All right. So the number one, true or false? The film was the inspiration for Twin Peaks. Uh, I'm gonna say true. That is correct. You're off to a flyer. Nice. <laughs> Good job. Okay. The prosthetic ear found in the field was actually cast off director David Lynch's actual ear. True or false? <laughs> Oh, well, that's an interesting question too. Um, <laughs> what would David Lynch? I reckon true again. That is actually false. Oh, bugger. Yeah. That's okay. a lot with Lynch, like it could be. Like, yeah, you know, yeah, yeah, yeah. <laughs> yeah. Exactly right. Oh, okay. Anybody else, I would have gone no, but you know. Yeah, it seems like something he would do for sure. Yeah. Um, number three, Chris Isaac was offered the role of Jeffrey Beaumont originally. Wow. Oh, is that a question? Was it? Oh, yeah. Sorry. Yeah. True or false? Well, there is a connection to Chris Isaac with the music later on. Um, I'm going to say true. That is true. Mm-hmm. Yeah. Good one. There's an extra one. Apparently, Val Kilmer also. Oh, one. really? Yeah. Yeah. He, he passed on it. So that was another one. Yeah. yeah. I can see why a lot of people passed. Yeah. Well, <laughs> yeah. Val, Val and Helen Kilmer. Mirren almost was cast oh, yeah. in the Rosalind oh, really? one as well. Wow. Yeah. Like yeah. right down the wall. Yeah. Going, going into it. But. Yeah, and then he met 
um, Helen Mirren, sorry, I'm stealing your segment, Sam, um, okay, please. <laughs> met uh, Rosalini apparently just a, in a, uh, a restaurant um, and, and spoke and then from mutual friends and then, and then afterwards sort of followed up and, and then believe it or not, they dated for four years after the filming. Oh, so wow. yeah, there you go. <laughs> so, <laughs> I love the the Vel Kilmer pass. He said when he read the script, it was it's pretty much pure pornography. <laughs> That's what he said. <laughs> Wrong. Uh, which is pretty funny. <laughs> yeah. um, so number four, Dennis Hopper says the word fuck in almost every sentence. Only one other character says that word other than him in the whole film. True or false? I'm thinking now. Uh, but he certainly says it a lot. Yeah. I'm going to say false. That's actually true. So there was literally only <laughs> one other person, and it's Ben. The character uh-huh. Ben says it once. Wow. Otherwise, all fucks wow. are with Dennis. Wow. We, which is funny because, again, I, apparently Lynch also, uh, he would never say the word on set. He couldn't say it himself. Oh, like really? he would Every time he'd tell make him read Dennis it. to say it, he'd point at it at the word and just go <laughs> say this word and, and even Hoffa was like he's a weird dude like you know yeah. that, like, yeah. that is weird yeah, yeah. very <laughs> all right Andrew lucky last this is a last question Jeffrey says I'm in the middle of a mystery exactly at the actual midpoint of the film at the one hour mark true or false uh, true that is true yeah well done you won Woo! You won hey. it. I got three out of five. I'm yeah. pretty happy with that. Yeah. That's pretty good because there's some pretty uh, abstract stuff there yeah. from an abstract movie. So <laughs> you did well. And of all the trivia we've done, again, being the Tom Lynch, uh, the Tom, the uh, David Lynch factor, you just never know with uh, what. No. Like it's so. This yeah. is usually a bit more obvious for other filmmakers, but yeah, yeah. It's, yeah. it's you just no. yeah. 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 <laughs> I had some uh, other funny ones, but um, apparently the the sex scene as well. Where, well, not the sex scene. I guess you call it rape scene. Really, um, where um, uh, Hopper is is on top of her and he's using the gas. Apparently, yeah. said in an interview. I don't know if you heard this one, but uh, they originally had helium. That he was <laughs> yeah, <laughs> yeah. <laughs> but he said he <laughs> just and apparently had such a high pitch, yeah, sort of voice. They were just like, yeah, I don't think that works. So they they yeah. tried with something else. But then also, as they were filming it, Rosalini also said that um, uh, Lynch just couldn't help but laugh during the scene. She couldn't understand why, because, you know, uh, but then when she said, yeah, when she rewatched it and realized like what Hopper was doing during it with his <laughs> why yeah, it was I mean, so it, funny. It's really. funny, but so, so horrible. It's oh, horrible. yeah. Yeah. yeah it's absolutely. this weird combination. Yeah. That's yeah. the great thing about it, isn't it? You're kind of going, oh, that's. Yeah, wow. Really hard to watch. I guess it's hard. That's it's hard to process these films. That's what makes it interesting. You're kind of not sure whether you should be laughing or yeah, Yeah. away. You know, yeah, yeah. And I feel like the helium was a good move to remove it because it probably would have definitely got laughs in the cinema. (laughs) Yeah, yeah, yeah. So I think that it was the right choice in the end. He reminds me a lot of that character from um, No Country for Old Men. You know. Oh, uh, yeah. Yes. Yeah, the other yeah, yeah. yeah, yeah. yeah. <laughs> Carries another canister around, but for other reasons. Yeah. That's right. <laughs> wow. <laughs> That's it. What an awesome. I mean, not that we're talking about that film, but like yeah. just how it blows out the the door locks. Yeah. That yeah. was really freaky. The and hearing well, it moving around and turning yeah. on, and they yeah. did that so well. Yeah, 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 and that yeah. scene where with the with the petrol ocean station owner, you know, pick yep. up, pick a side. <laughs> yeah, yeah, that's right. <laughs> yeah, that's right. Yeah. Oh my god. I, yeah. Um, given, I mean, given that film, um, Blue Velvet has a lot of takes on. I mean, obviously, yeah, it's kind of more about kidnapping and stuff like that. But I mean, mm-hmm. there is kind of, I guess, almost a level of like domestic violence to to women yeah. as well. That's why I was curious yeah. if if that was also yeah, yeah. like a, a, an impact of of your film given um the, yeah. the themes of yours to to a degree. I, I, I don't see a direct connection really, yeah. but um certainly the violence is really some the sort of violence that I had never really experienced before. Like it's especially on the women, it's like a you know, because Rosalini mm. you can tell she sort of hates herself that she's saying hit me, hit me, which kind yes. of very disturbing know. you know yep. goes against all what you've been programmed <laughs> to yes. think, you know? um so uh certainly that scene of the domestic violence or whatever you want to call it is very disturbing and i think that's kind of why it stayed with me yeah 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 absolutely yeah brutal brutal yeah. um 
And yeah, I guess the big thing too, for before we round up and all of that, where can people go and see your new movie, Reef Stalked? Yeah, yeah excellent. Um, well, it's just finished at the cinema. So it's coming out on uh, all the VOD and not necessarily streamers, but I think it's Prime and, you know, YouTube and all those sort of Google, uh, that where you go and, you know, online and you pay yeah. three or four bucks and you can see it. Yeah. But it's coming out soon. I think in a week or two it'll be out. Beautiful. Uh, on, on Shutter as well. I think I saw that. Yeah, sorry, that? sorry. In yeah. America, you know, the round place, it's on Shutter, yeah. Yeah, great. Yeah, yeah. And it was um, getting distributed. Sorry, Paul. It was getting distributed also um, in uh, Europe, wasn't it? And the US, yeah, or there was screenings over there. Yeah. 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 So what's happened is, um, so if you haven't got a, a big American film, various distributors buy it and they send it out at different times. So, yeah, in Europe, I know that it's been bought by the French, the Spanish, the English, I think the Italians, a bunch of Scandinavian countries. So, yeah, various distributors will be sending you out at various times. That's yeah. awesome. Mm. Get the, uh, the global uh, yeah. viewership yeah. up. It's very yeah. cool. In fact, in France, in, uh, in September, there's a shark festival, festival of shark oh, films, and it's yes. going to be on in Paris. So oh, wow. That's awesome. Shark Are you going to get to that one, Andrew? Great. That's a good uh, excuse no, to get over there. It might be a little hard to get to at this stage. I, yeah. I tried just to get, I did, went just to New Zealand recently and I was ah. in queues for three hours getting in. And getting oh, my in. God. Oh, gosh. Yes. Yeah. Yeah, yes. gonna, I think I'm not going to travel for a little while. Yeah, <laughs> yeah, yeah travel's not it. fun. We yeah. were in Queensland and I got our flight cancelled and everything. Oh, yeah. So it's all a bit chaos. Yeah, it's yeah. Like yeah. Chaotic, isn't it? Yeah, yeah. yeah. Um, you've uh, have you got any other films coming up? I think I, I read somewhere that you've got a, uh, a, a almost a comedy coming up. Is that is that kind of right around? Uh, yeah, I'm trying to get it up. Um, it's sort yeah. of funny, you know. I have been pigeonholed a bit, so when I present with a comedy, I go, "Where's the crocodile?" Yeah. Um, <laughs> <laughs> but yeah, but um, yeah, it's a it's a film called Melodica Vampire Slayers, but it's actually what I the tagline is um, Spinal Tap meets Dracula, which you know. Oh I, wow! I, what a mix. yeah! I'd I'd love to see that film because it's um. It, yeah. Yeah. You know, yeah, yeah. So it's a great concept, and uh, the script's pretty good. I wrote it with a friend of mine called Mick Wanamaka, and um, and yeah, it's all ready to go. But with that sort of film, you can't, it's kind of cast dependent, and so yeah. it's getting to the right cast now, which is going to be whether it gets made or not. But yeah, I mean, it's a lot of fun. Excellent. That's awesome. Oh. That sounds. That combination sounds unstoppable. Sounds, yeah, yeah, I, I, know. I like Jeez, it. That's a good pitch right there. <laughs> <laughs> that, yeah, that's your that's your elevator pitch. It's yeah, one exactly. Yeah. yeah, that's all you have to say. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> it sells itself. Yeah. It's unbelievable. <laughs> oh my god, oh, uh, this has been a pleasure, Andrew. This yeah. has been a great chat. Um, yeah. And yeah, to to everyone, get out there um, and check out Reef Stalked on on demand video. Yeah. If you're overseas, go see it. Yes. Exactly. Thank you. Absolutely. It's been a pleasure as well. No worries. Beautiful. Thanks, Andrew. All right. Cheers. Thanks very much, Andrew. Bye. Awesome.